Thank you, Kevin. That's an awfully long introduction and embarrassing for the moderator. Um, and thanks, Lisa, for giving me a chance to be part of this uh, really important conference. I know a lot of work has gone into it, and I expect by this afternoon this room will be absolutely filled. Um, so uh, this panel, which I have a huge honor of uh, moderating, actually, is made up. Two of the panelists are uh, ex-bosses of mine. Um, <laughs> Uh, and we think it'll set the stage for the next two days in many ways by providing a historical uh, context uh, for everything we'll be talking about here in the next couple of days. And although there have been uh, many, many people, in fact, I see a, a, quite a few of you here in the real world over the past 30 years have played significant and important leadership roles in what we're now uh, called climate services or climate information, certainly climate science, and uh, of course the IRI. Um, if I were limited, just this is me personally, if I were limited to naming four people who, through courageous leadership and, uh, and, and their efforts from the early days, could be these four, and the four people on this panel. So, uh, as Kathy mentioned, first you're going to hear uh, from a, our first panelist, Michael Crow. Uh, he's um, president of Arizona State University. He wanted to be here, but he has a board of regents meeting, so uh, he said even if he uh, might from time to time miss his kids' birthdays, he can't miss the board of regents meeting. And for any of you who've been presidents of the university, no. Uh, <laughs> And we're going to hear, uh, so he'll, he'll do that, and then I'll call the panel up. Uh, at that point, we'll set up a table and we'll just keep going with that. So um, I'm going to introduce Mike. Michael Crow, um, a known to a number of you, particularly those of you who've been here at Columbia University for a while, and now the press, I think, uh, 16th president at uh, Arizona State uh, University, where he's been since uh, 2002. Um, he's a fellow of the American Association for Advancement of Sciences, uh, the National Academy of Public Administration. He's authored a number of books uh, designing what he calls designing new knowledge enterprises uh, and new science and technology policies at highly adapted uh, higher education institutions. Uh, and he, his real push is to take a, Arizona State University to be a leading public research university uh, of uh, metropolitan uh, region in, uh, in Tempe, near, near Phoenix. Um, he was previously, and I was just referring to that, executive vice provost and professor of science and technology policy at Columbia University. He's on the panel because, uh, like the, the other three panelists, played a really significant role. He was, uh, in fact, the building we're in has a lot to do with uh, his raising the money from uh, Monell family to, to be able to host it. And so he played an instrumental role in pulling uh, the, uh, the uh, proposal and uh, together for the, uh, what has become the IRI. So with that, I'm going to uh, let Mike talk to you by video, and then we'll call the other the rest of the panel. And it's going to match what happened. Hopefully. Hi, uh, Michael Crow here. Sorry I can't be there with you. I really wanted to be at uh, this event because this is, uh, from a number of perspectives, both personally, professionally, I think scientifically, and uh, even beyond that, socially and even globally, this is really an important 20-year uh, anniversary. Uh, 20 years ago, as you all know, was the moment in time when uh, scientists could really say uh, definitively that uh, El Nino events, climatic effecting events, uh, were going to be predictable in a way where the information might be useful. Uh, and of course at the time that meant then that we had to find a way to uh, uh, be uh, really powerfully useful with that information. Uh, and we had to do something which uh, for some of you on the more uh, meteorological side of things might think is commonplace, which is the translation of scientific information into day-to-day -day life. And that does work, but it works best when it is near term in an individual or an organization's uh, time scale. Longer term things I think are quite uh, problematic. Uh, also we're having significant uh, and have had significant issues with uh, translation of scientific information into effective decision making by all kinds of organizations. Uh, years ago in fact I gave a, a talk to a joint meeting of the Geological Society of America and the Ecological Society of America where we were looking at 
uh, issues about Hurricane Mitch and the prediction of the rainfall that Hurricane Mitch back in the late 90s delivered to uh, Central America. The volcanoes that ultimately uh, were a part of a massive flood and mudslide and so forth, that was all predicted, all scientifically modeled, all capable of being understood uh, by many, but not translatable into decisions. And so the exciting thing for me, and what this represents with the IRI, uh, the evolution of the IRI, the success of the IRI, the whole notion of the International Research Institute for Climate Prediction and Society, or Climate and Society, uh, is that we've gotten to this point where we're inching along, slowly moving ourselves out of the whole notion of uh, thinking in the Stone Age and starting to think in the modern age. And what I mean by that is, as we build scientific tools that provide information to enhance decisions over mid and long range time frames, how do we find a way to integrate that knowledge and that information into uh, non-scientific decision making? That could be economic based decision making in terms of companies, it could be political decision making in terms of political jurisdictions or politically derived uh, uh, allocation models like water uh, allocation models or what have you. How do we make all of that work? And so the, the, the risk then is that we develop, and I think we've experienced some of this in the uh, broader global climate change uh, uh, array or arena, uh, what, we've, what we've missed is this ability to find a way in which scientific prediction, scientifically based prediction and outcomes, scientifically based prediction and social outcomes, scientifically, scientifically based prediction and social, economic, political, uh, and other kinds of outcomes can all be integrated into a series of tools, devices, mechanisms that can uh, enhance uh, quality of life for everybody that's involved. Now, uh, sitting here today, 20 years later, uh, people say, well, this is all obvious. In fact, many of you in the room may think this is all obvious. Well, it's obviously uh, not obvious. Okay. And so what I mean by that is that we're really struggling. This is an area where we're struggling. And even in 1996, and then uh, those of us that were involved in finding a way to uh, design the IRI, advance the IRI, fund the IRI uh, uh, against uh, substantial uh, uh, competing forces, uh, if, if you will, uh, all of us were thinking, could we build a prototype organization that would prove the point that scientific predictions, mid to long term in their uh, time frame, and other decisions could be integrated into a single process. In fact, was there a way in which we could move away from the notion that the science was in fact the prediction, but in fact the outcome was the prediction? And if the outcome was the prediction, could we then move to the point where with an outcome being predicted, could we then affect behavior? Could we then affect uh, the way people made decisions? Even decisions over uh, multiple seasons, and ultimately even decisions over multiple years. Now again, keep in the back of your mind, as it relates to global climate change, we're still a long way from being able to prove this point. So even then, 20 years ago, we were saying to ourselves, if we could figure out how to do this with the kinds of time frames associated with El Nino prediction, might that then lay for us the knowledge foundation to allow us to know what to do for longer uh, climate change uh, uh, forces? And so that was really, the, at the outset, what we were really working toward. And so what we began to think about was the notion of, a, of moving from a weather service to a climate service. What we began to think about was moving from weather to climate to uh, uh, global to uh, uh, being able to find ways in which we, we could enhance outcomes for farmers, outcome, out, enhance outcomes for uh, uh, fisheries, enhance outcomes for, uh, for uh, conservation management, enhance outcomes for for all kinds of groups, uh, water users, water suppliers, and so forth. But the notion was, could we take this living, breathing, dynamic planet, uh, predict how it uh, uh, was behaving, predict uh, uh, its relationship with what we're doing with it, and could we lay down a new kind of knowledge base? And so I think, and I hope, that in the 20 years since we've figured out, and I'm based on everything that I know about what the IRI's been doing, based on everything that that I have seen based on where we are, we have taken great leaps to enhancing the kind of knowledge that we uh, produce. A way to think about it is the following. Uh, most scientists, rightfully, focus on understanding nature. 
And when nature is understood, they move on to something else in nature that we don't understand. That's fantastic. That, call that a discovery-driven uh, science. Some scientists focus on uh, using science to produce some kind of solution, some kind of uh, thing from the scientific understanding. And for the most part, you can call that applied science, or you can call that engineering, and, and we're doing really fantastic things there in terms of building tools and algorithms and mechanisms and so forth. There's another area of science that I think is unbelievably important that for whatever reason we haven't been able to get social scientists and behavioral scientists, natural scientists and engineers to come together on, and this is something that I call outcome science. There's an outcome that we're looking for. Success for societies, plural. Uh, agricultural success in regions that need to maintain it or develop it. All these areas that we need and desire certain outcomes. Think of sustainability as an outcome. Think of sustainability as an outcome on a regional basis. Think of sustainability as an outcome on a national basis or on a global basis. If you think of sustainability as an outcome, and that is the balance between the built environment and the natural uh, environment, and if you think of sustainability of science as an outcome that you're, that sustainability as an outcome that you're driven toward, then you need a science and a set of capabilities and a set of ways of thinking to really move toward that. And so I would like to think, and I do think, and Sorry, I can't be there to share this, this with you, that the IRI was an uh, early generation, outcome-oriented science enterprise focused on the delivery of knowledge, know-how, solutions, mechanisms, and insights that can help human beings to adapt to the natural forces uh, that uh, make up all of the complexity that this planet uh, brings to us in a way in which we will have forever an opportunity to change our thinking, change our decision making, and become more adaptive to, and then subsequently have superior outcomes from our relationship with those natural systems. So, having said all of that, uh, uh, again, I'm sorry that I can't be there with you. Uh, I'm looking forward to the results of the two-day uh, meeting that you all are going to have out there, and I am ever hopeful that institutions such as mine here at Arizona State University with our Global Institute of Sustainability and our School for Earth and Space Exploration and other uh, centers, institutes, and programs that we've built here, drawing heavily from the lessons that we've learned uh, with the IRI, will someday be a part of a network of a series of institutions focused on this notion of outcome-oriented science. Science producing certain human outcomes, where science is in fact not the objective by itself, but the outcome is the objective by itself. And so, again, you all have a nice meeting out there, and I look forward to hearing uh, uh, what everybody talks about. Thanks a lot. Okay. Um, yeah, thank you. So I'm going to ask uh, our panel to come up, and whoever is going to help set up the table. Because of that, but also because of some of his other interests, uh, Mark was uh, 
uh, instrumental in creating the IRI. Um, and he also founded and directed the Interdisciplinary Masters of Arts program in Climate Society here in Columbia. He's uh, got lots of awards, um, and so what I think I'm just going to do is name the places that gave him the awards. American Meteorological Society, the Scripps uh, Institution of Oceanography, the World Meteorological Organization. Did someone, did someone turn the mic down? Uh, the American Geophysical Union, and he's a member of the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the National Academy of Sciences. So what I'm going to do, Mark, is I'm going to have you give your, your uh, little bit, and I'm going to introduce Mickey, and we'll do it that way. say he invented it. He saw the value of doing work like this before anybody else did, and he had the, he had the whole field to himself for quite a long time. Okay. I'm sometimes not sure he wasn't happier then, but uh, <laughs> for the rest of us, it's, it's terrific that he started this, and he's had a huge impact on everyone that's followed, and I don't think we could be here in the same way without it. Mike Crow, whom you just heard, and I should also add that all of these Michaels are, every one of them is exceedingly articulate, um, which again distinguishes me. But <laughs> Mike Crow is, is an entrepreneurial academic administrator, and that's almost an oxymoron. Uh, 20 years ago, he was the vice president for research here, and really it was his partnership with Mike Hall that made it possible for there to be such a thing as the first El Nino Summit and the IRI. And uh, I miss having my crow around, there's nobody like him. And my call, okay, was a creative bureaucrat, and that is an oxymoron. Okay. <laughs> 20 years ago or so, he was the manager of the Togo program, which uh, really established the scientific basis for seasonal to meter annual predictions and then the extension to impacts. And we see a lot of my fellow natural scientists who were involved in TOGA are here. Um, I won't name you all. They're mostly recognizable by having, uh, except for Steve Zibiak, for having white hair. Um, okay. And my call is the key figure of the PIR I come to life. What he accomplished when he was in the government is impossible today, but the more I think about it, the more I think um, it was impossible when he did it. So I have no idea how he did the impossible, but it happened, and I'm very grateful for it. In fact, I always felt very lucky in, as a scientist, that together with uh, colleagues, some of whom were in this room, we got to kind of build a theory about equatorial oceanography and ocean atmosphere interaction in the tropics and uh, you know, come to an understanding of El Nino. But I think we were also lucky in having uh, my fellow panel members around at the time because we got both the institutional support and the vision to take this forward beyond the natural sciences, which was makes uh, such a difference today and is why the reach of that science is far greater than uh, simply understanding the natural world. Okay. The first El Nino Summit was 20 years ago, but I would want to start, go back 30 years to about the time we made the first forecast. If I go back almost exactly 30 years, okay, then I can say it's the 30th anniversary of when science rejected the forecasting paper that Steve Zibiak and John Dolan and I submitted. Um, kind of a landmark event. <laughs> uh, we 
But Ellie Superman always says, you haven't done anything important unless it's been rejected by science or nature. <laughs> the, the, um, we had started forecasting during the previous summer. And I was invited at the end of that summer. You know, we just came up with this idea that was exciting, of course, to us, because we would never done anything before. We used this dynamical model to make forecasts. And it worked, which was really astonishing. And I had been invited to give a review talk on El Nino at the end of the summer in some workshop about the U.S. climate plan. You may not always know it, but actually the U.S. does have a climate plan. Um, and I was really excited about the forecasting results, so I stopped, talked about that more than I reviewed El Nino. And the, some of the senior officials there were absolutely appalled. Uh, I'd gone off script and gotten into this new science. And um, that, I was kind of stunned. I mean, I was pretty young then. Didn't know as much about the ways of the world as uh, I've learned since. But my call recognized the importance of what I presented. And I think of that really as the place where uh, the story of why we're here today and why there is an IRI uh, begins. Okay. Uh, though the first forecast we made in 1986, which was published in Nature uh, before, as a forecast before it happened, it was successful. It didn't really convince a number of our colleagues that dynamical forecasting of El Nino was for real. Um, but at the beginning of 1990, many people saw the signs and portents of an El Nino coming. And the model said, no, it's not going to happen this year. It's going to happen the following year. And indeed, that was what happened. And I think that, uh, more than the initial forecast, was what it took to convince people that there was something real there. Now, soon after that, I really wanted to get out of the forecasting business because um, you do this long enough, you know you're going to bust. <laughs> uh, also. I mean, Steve and I were two guys in an academic place, and it, it should have been done, we thought, by some kind of seasonal to interannual version of ECMWF. <clears throat> that was our model. It wasn't my idea alone. Um, I would single out, um, <clears throat> along with Steve, Ed Saratek, Saratek Shukla, and Antonio Mora, who became the first director of the IRI. These people deeply involved in pushing it forward. <coughs> Sorry. And um, I have to apologize to many others who might not get around to naming. But as the idea developed, and it began to involve Michael and others in OGP, like Jim Weiser and so on, uh, it expanded from the notion of just a climate forecasting center to an institution that would take on the end-to-end -end job of going from forecasts to information that stakeholders could make use of. And <clears> there <throat> was a lot to learn about this, and I expect Mike and Vicky will reiterate some themes that Mike Crow began and take it further, um, and that we'll talk about it more over the next few days. But I want to contrast <clears throat> When we, where we were when we made the first forecast in 1986. We didn't know whether we should even release it. Okay. It had been a devastating El Nino a few years before in 1982. We didn't want to scare people. And then a lot of people say, well, what if you're wrong? Uh, which, by the way, is still a good question when people are making forecasts. Look at 2014. And, um, you know, when we thought about that a lot, and we also then thought about, well, what if we're right? Because we, think, we felt we had information that could be valuable to people. Um, and, uh, you know, we were debating, should we keep it this to ourselves or not? And I think, as Max alluded, the things have progressed enormously since then. And I think I'll stop there, and we'll have more time to discuss these matters later. Great. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so you helped me introduce the other two, that's awesome.
And I see that uh, Jeff Sachs has joined us. Hi, Jeff. Uh, you missed the video of Michael Crow where he was saying a lot of interesting things about you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so uh, the the other Mike, Mickey, Mickey Blanks, um, is at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Um, wait, you're right now, but that's where he's coming from. Um, it, and uh, at the, where he's the director of the Consortium for Capacity Building. If one were to uh, go back, and I'm sure that Mickey could correct this, uh, but certainly back to 1981, he and uh, Dana Thompson published their first uh, multidisciplinary El Nino book. Um, the title is Resource Management, Environmental Uncertainty, Lesson, Lessons from Coastal Upwelling Fisheries. Since then, he's published another uh, a number of books. Um, let's see. Sorry, I'm a little disorganized here. Uh, lessons from the, uh, learned from the 1997-98 El Nino, once burned, twice shy. He's most recently doing a project for USAID, uh, Office for Disaster Assistance, uh, for the, from 2012 to 2015. Lessons learned about lessons learned about hydromet disaster risk reduction in a changing climate. And according to the bio he gave me, it says here he's still researching. <laughs> I'm still up there, I guess. <laughs> um, a lot of things come to mind. Uh, having been given instruction on what to talk about and make it sort of personal, but I think uh, speaking on behalf of IMPACT's researchers, Walter, I mean, there are a lot of us here, okay, and a lot of us not here, who probably would benefit from being here. That it brought to mind the story about uh, the time when, uh, I think it was on the Johnny Carson show, or one of those shows, and uh, Fred Astaire had passed away, and they were talking about Fred Astaire, and he was the best, the greatest dancer in the world, and, uh, you know, on and on and on. And then uh, a friend uh, a, a friend of uh, Ginger Rogers said, uh, you know that uh, Ginger Rogers did everything Fred Astaire did, but backwards and in heels. <laughs> that, that, we, we are Ginger Rogers, uh, the impacts people, you know, we were constantly swimming upstream with a focus on science. And uh, so we were the fly in the ointment, we were the mosquito that was always buzzing around someone's head, just annoying. And uh, it, it really has been, uh, for me it was interesting and I didn't care because I was kind of working for a long time at NCAR, and uh, I was, uh, I thought I had made a, what I call an adhocracy in the belly of a bureaucracy. I didn't break any rules, but I sure bent a lot of them. All legitimate to kind of get the social side represented. So my career started uh, when I found actually in the basket at Lafayette College, a chartreuse colored circular. And as I went into the office, I just noticed this bright thing in the basket. It was unusual, 1973, that color didn't exist. And here, it was chartreuse, we called it then, not neon green. And I saw a national center, and I picked it out of the basket because our chairman used to throw away mail and he thought no one should read or would be interested in. And I just said, national center, and I read the first paragraph. And it was about the atmosphere and the oceans and the modeling and all that other stuff. And uh, card punching then, I guess. And, uh, and then it said, and social scientists may also apply. So I called the National Center for Atmospheric Research. And uh, they uh, uh, told me that, oh yeah, we have social scientists, or we want them or something. It was at the time of the National Hale Research Experiment. Uh, I went out and visited to check out NCAR to see if it was worth my time, actually. Met Steve Schneider, Walt Roberts, a lot of people. And, and I applied for a postdoc, and I got it. And uh, about, uh, that's when I started to look at the value of a long-range forecast. Um, I've been lucky in picking topics because it was right at the end of uh, the five-year Sahelian drought in West Africa. And I looked at the long-range forecast. What if you knew perfectly what was going to happen in a year? What could you do? And then you drop on reality on top of wishful thinking and what ought to be. Every forecast should be a value. But there are a lot of constraints. 
over which we don't have control, many of which we don't even know about unless you start to look for it. So the third, the two studies I did, West Africa, Spring Week region in Canada, and the third one was El Nino. And I've gotten interested in El Nino, uh, really not El Nino, but coastal Mokwele. And Jim mentioned the book that we did for Wiley, and uh, it was called Resource Management and Environmental Uncertainty. That wasn't the original title. The original title had El Nino in it. The editor said, take it out. No one knows what it is. 1981. This is 1981. All of the chapters inside are about, about El Nino. They're all El Nino related. And uh, about a year after the 82, 83 event, he called to apologize. For <laughs> <laughs> I to change that. So anyway, that's the personal stuff. But I was inspired. I got into the science. I had been doing revolutions and other things. I got into the science. Uh, the oceans and the atmosphere, and I remember the IDOE program had a lot of influence on me. And Kuwaya, Coastal Upwelling Ecosystems Analysis. And through that, I went to Peru back in 76, and they were setting up, uh, Joe O'Brien and Dave Andrew were setting up uh, an experiment for Kuwaya that they sort of couldn't have because El Nino came. So the upwelling was disrupted and all that. Anyway, so. That's kind of the, the interest. I, I want to say that there are five El Ninos I'm interested in. So I thought I'd share that with you. I, I have a lot to say. I, I'm collapsing about 50 years here. But, <laughs> but I wanted to tell you the five I like, OK? 72, 73, all right? That's the one that turned me on, because that was the collapse of the premium fisheries. And that was the collapse of the fish meal exports and, and that shifted to soy meal and other things. So it showed the global implication of this thing that it wasn't until 1979, a 69, that Bjorkman said, oh, it's not just a Peru problem, it's based in Hawaii. 1974, Flown said, it's global. You can see teleconnections. Uh, that's the first time I came across the word teleconnection. So the 72, 73 is fascinating. 82, 83, of course, was also the biggest, at, at the time, they were calling it the biggest in, uh, in 100 years, since 70, 1877, 78. And then there's the 97, 98 event uh, where I was in Ecuador and got smoked. But anyway, and everybody <laughs> at the conference knew about it before I came back from the mug. I don't know how word travels fast on that. <laughs> so those are three, right? 72, 73, I call it the El Nino of the scientists. There were scientists working on upwelling and tide, tidal movement, you know, work the and stuff. And, uh, but a lot of other scientists got involved after 72, 73. The 82, 83 event, I call the El Nino of the governments. Even Australia and other countries, all of a sudden, wait, this has global implications. Let's, uh, let's put some time and energy and funds into this. And then you had you know, toga, and a lot, a lot of things going on. The 97, 98 event is the El Nino of the people. You could go to Kenya, they would name them Atatus, El Nino, the buses in Mexico, El Nino. So we started to see the name get popularized. People didn't know what it was, perhaps, but they knew something not good's gonna happen with El Nino, and, and they picked up on the name. The fourth El Nino is the uh, 1957-58. The, I call it the IGY El Nino. By happenstance, just like monitoring CO2 with Mauna Loa, they had to fight to get that measured, like Keeling did. Yeah, Keeling did. Um, Warren Worcester and a cluster of, of oceanographers and fisheries people, they were studying upwelling, and they actually documented 57, 58, which was the other big event before 72, 73. And the fifth one I'm mentioning in a speculative way there are some interesting articles about it. 1877-78. Why that one? The biggest one, you know, people today don't care about what happened before 2000. And certainly, who cares what happened in the 1800s? But what happened was that at the time of that El Nino, which was the biggest, they said in 82, 83, it's the biggest in 100 years, the volcano of Cotopaxi erupted with a high bale index. And I tried to get the, my colleagues at NCAR to look at what happens, what co-mingles. And I, I actually 
sort of was laughed at. Uh, back in, in the 70s. I tried to get them to look at that. But uh, for those who've been watching the news, code epoxy is bubbling now. There have been minor eruptions already. People have been evacuated. And I'm wondering what happens when you have the biggest El Nino, the, the first of the biggest El Nino of the century now, and what if code epoxy does erupt? What would that commingling mean? I wish we had done that. I've been able to convince people to look at that commingling. Anyway, so those are my five. Uh, and now we have this other one called by some the Bruce Lee of El Nino's. It's no longer the Godzilla. The Godzilla was uh, JPL's term uh, for 2014, which didn't happen. And we can talk about that. The 2015 El Nino, 2015-16 El Nino, is not the 2014 El Nino. It was a, an error. It's OK. Uh, we can talk about it. So I'll stop. I don't know how long I've been talking, but this, I got more to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't want to hear it, don't sit near me at lunch. <laughs> All right, thanks, thank you. So um, next person, uh, Dr. <coughs> Michael Hall. Mike uh, is retired from the Federal Service. He's spent uh, 20 plus years, no, I mean 30 years ago. Uh, he was more, most recently a director of the Office of Global Programs, which he created um, within NOAA, and uh, where he was running multidisciplinary research uh, programs focused primarily on El Nino, but really across the board. And in fact, a lot of the programs that uh, he devised or played a role in, in designing and certainly in promoting and funding, um, you know, folks are here in the room. Um, one of them very early, the Global Weather Experiment of late 1970s. Is that you went? No, Global Weather Experiment. Global Weather Experiment. Yeah. And then uh, the uh, TOGA, Tropical Ocean and Global Atmosphere. I was looking over there, I see uh, David Halpern, uh, McFadden, Trent Berger. Um, for, those, for you younger folks, just look for someone with white hair uh, or no hair. Uh, Chad. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, we're involved in these programs. Anyway, I, I never. Um, so, yeah, but uh, he was also one of the, uh, a national leader, not just within NOAA, but a national leader. He is one of uh, four people who founded the U.S. Global Change Research Program, which is the foundation for pretty much everything that uh, uh, those of us in this room and worldwide uh, are basing off of it, certainly within the United States, um, and, uh, and then including, of course, the IRI. And there's some interesting stories, so if you do want to sit uh, here about it, sit, do sit next to Mike during lunch. Uh, he, too, has a number of awards. Uh, the Presidential Rank Award for Meritorious Executive from the Department of Com Commerce, an award from the American Meteorological Society, a uh, gold medal from uh, the U.S. Department of Commerce, Waldo Smith Medal from the AGU. Uh, he's a physical oceanographer from the University of Washington, the Huskies. And uh, so I think I'm hoping we'll come back around and wrap this up at the end, but I'm hoping you're starting to sense the theme uh, here of uh, this panel. Thank you, Jim. One of the things that's uh, interesting about serving on a panel with uh, the likes of uh, Mike, Mickey, and Mark, and speaking last, you end up more or less rewriting your presentation at any time because some of the things they've had to say. So I hope you'll bear with me as I try to do that and still tell you uh, a picture for you that I want to try to paint. Essentially, I think we're, we're here reflecting on the roots of IRI, how it came about and why, what are some of the things it's, it's done, and how has that activity gradually folded into the evolution of the climate service. So I want to talk very specifically about the evolution of the climate service as well. I want to do all this briefly. Um, and in the process, I want to call out as a result of things uh, these three previous have said, uh, some what I think to be really fundamental turning points um, that given their outcome have, have a lot to do with where we stand today. 
and uh, I will mention a few names as I go. By tomorrow afternoon on the panel I'm going to moderate, I'll mention some more names. Uh, why would I do this? Well, because I'm up here and I can mention some names. And as I look out at the audience, there are so many good friends here. It just takes my breath away. IRI came about for two or three reasons, but one of the more remarkable of the reasons, remarkable because it is not common, very early on, the scientists uh, involved in Toga, many, many brilliant people, mostly physical scientists in the very early stage, came to me and to the WMO and to the Intergovernmental Toga body and said, we think that this decade-long research program should have a practical legacy that means something to real people. So already at that stage, people like Mickey were having an influence on physical scientists, making them feel relevant, excited about what they might do. And they called for, rather than 10 years of research, at which point there is an end, and not too much else happens. They said, let's leave something in place. And this was before the idea of a center per se was even, uh, was even fully hatched. In parallel with that, during the Toga activity, Mark and a colleague, uh, whom I'll call out, did something pretty remarkable. And I want to characterize it for those of you who aren't physical scientists. I think Mark will forgive me for being overly simplistic. About that time in the early 90s, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the early 80s, middle 80s, most of the world focused, uh, of physical research focused on general circulation models of the atmosphere and their counterpart on the ocean, which daringly were even then called general circulation models, even though they couldn't possibly be. And Toga and El Nino raised the possibility of, my goodness, we'll have to combine these models into something profound. Each of these circulation models is incredibly complicated. It takes a lot of computer time. Enter Mark Cain and Steve Zibiak, and they posed a very simple question. Suppose instead of beating our two O and A circulation models to death, Suppose we take a very simple ocean and a very simple atmosphere, simple dynamically, and we hypothesize that the essence of El Nino is the interaction of these two rather than the full-blown expression of these two in a digital model. Well, that was one of the turning points I want to call out. It was a remarkable event because they took an almost ridiculously simple ocean, coupled it with an almost ridiculously simple atmosphere, and they discovered that, my goodness, when we do this, we capture the essence of El Nino. And I've used the word ridiculously to describe those two fluid models, because very many in our community used implementing, wanting to implement a Toga O, Toga Ocean. By implication, he implied there would also be a toga atmosphere. And there were numerous agencies funding toga activity, but the maverick in NOAA had some funds that he could apply to anything he wanted to. That was an historical accident, which we won't discuss at length. But he decided to do something that uh, might be unique, and I believe it was a turning point. He said no. We'll only entertain proposals that integrate the ocean and atmosphere into a single thing. Seems to be the essence of what's happened. The models reveal something remarkable. I believe that was a turning point, and it was not done without any pain. The, those who wanted an O component and an A component were not terribly happy with this maverick. The, Integration of proposals led to some remarkable developments. And finally, later on, and towards the end of the Toga program, another transition happened, which is the fourth uh, turning point I'll call out. The physical scientists and their program managers in the physical sciences 
actually embraced social sciences as an integral part of what they were trying to do and it would encourage <coughs> That was also a maverick activity, not without a fair amount of pain. But the reason for that, if you want to pat someone on the back here at this meeting, there are a handful of people here who were influential in that, illustrating to us the value and the need for supporting social sciences research and integrating it into a composite program. But none of the individuals you might thank for that had any more influence than, than Nikki in his early years of research. Now, let me reflect on a time at service just for a couple of minutes. Essentially, the 35-year history that Mark referred to goes clear back to the very end of the Global Atmospheric Research Program, which was the Global Weather Experiment was its final exercise. And, and that program had a second objective, which was to try to set forth a physical basis for studying climate. I had the good fortune of knowing that giant names in that program, people like Ron Sumi and Joe Smagorinsky and Dick Reed, people like Bert Boleyn, who long before he chaired the first IPCC was a meteorologist representing his country, uh, among many, in uh, the Global Atmospheric Research Program. These were remarkable individuals without exception. They, of course, each held a view of climate as a research topic, it would be hard to describe an average view, but I'm going to anyway. The average view was humbled by, by weather forecasting, the inherently unpredictable part of the atmosphere. These individuals thought that climate, with all of its numerous interactive elements from ice, land surface, atmosphere, ocean, etc., and we now know the people was an intractable scientific research program. They thought very little chance of making much progress, and that was the average view. So back in the late, very end of the 70s and the early 80s, uh, around 1980, it was a daunting thing to think about doing climate research. Well, of course, what we discovered is that there is a memory in the system, and much of the memory is in the interaction of its components, the ocean, the atmosphere, the land surface, the atmosphere, et cetera. And I want to tell you, as we reflect on the evolution of the National uh, 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 Climate Service, we have made remarkable progress. This meeting and this panel has led me to think a bit about, about uh, how far along are we in setting up a National Climate Service, and indeed a Climate Service for Humanity in the National as well as National. And I'm going to suggest to you uh, that we're very, very far along, remarkably far along. And that should excite us. And we should all, uh, every one of us who's here today, uh, should take great pride in the fact that we've gone so far toward doing that. I'm going to wrap up by, by telling you what maybe sound like bad news, but is, of course, good news. So if you look at that 35 years, there was one thing going on that I can't call out, but I can assure you it was absolutely intensive the entire period of time. And I'll quote an illustrious leader uh, outside our field, General Eisenhower, who was a remarkable individual, and I've studied some of what he did and how. He said something about planning that's interesting, and you should all remember it and somehow assimilate it as fundamental to self. He said, plans are nothing. He was speaking about D-Day, the incredible events he'd been involved in. He said, plans are nothing, but planning is everything. Planning is a preparation of the eventuality that will lead to your not being able to implement your plan, but being able to adapt and adjust and continually move forward. And one of the things you'll find is in 30 years, including until very recently, planning was a very core central activity, building on the dark, 
And there were early views of what we might achieve. The National Climate Service was a lofty goal of the NCA very early. I think in recent years, planning has fallen by the wayside as we advance concepts of human force warming, et cetera, and we encounter resistance of various kinds. We become discouraged. And the last thing we think is we need more money for research or we need an expanded research program. There are many questions that we should be studying in some detail or not. And I want to suggest to you what I call the bad news. You must do the planning approach the government mechanisms of the United States and abroad and broaden and deepen your research program because, because you've created a climate service. Every time you do a service, you do a product, it's useful, it's fundamental to decision making, it affects uh, the world in the way Mike and Mickey have described, you also illuminate some new problems that you know nothing about. It's an inevitable consequence. You're going to be doing a service. What if we're wrong? We've been wrong. We'll be wrong in the future. Um, and being wrong about aspects of greenhouse warming is a pretty nice stakes proposition. Why is, uh, what's going on in the Antarctic? How is it different than what's happening in the rest of the, in the, rest of the world? The truth is, we don't know nearly enough about that. So I'll offer you a proposition, and I used to say this to people in my office and my colleagues, advisors. Often they thought I was kidding, but I was not kidding. There is a time to raise money, and it's not when you think. When the system seems flush, now is the time. Not so, because everybody and his dog is asking for money, and they all have a good case, and they all have patrons, and your message, your request is lost in the good times. There is a time when you can approach the system with a high probability of success. And that's when the system thinks it's broke. Well, of course, the system never broke. That's nonsense. Uh, the United States has money to burn by and large. And when you ask, and no one else is, that's when you're the most apt to succeed. Plan, go forward, bring in new resources, new resources. Don't stop thinking and planning. Believe in yourselves, believe in your enterprise, believe that the success you've achieved to date will engender further success. And the application successes that you achieve will engender further support for research because the people who use your information will want you to be able to tell them about the Antarctic versus Greenland versus the Arctic, etc. Um, so uh, don't get discouraged. Um, the broad brush picture of climate, the evolution of the climate service looks like this. Nature first revealed herself, itself, if you prefer, on interannual timescales and said, come and study me on interannual timescales and I'll let you in on a secret or two. And we had great success. And it was it characterized the decade, the decade of the 80s. The decade of the 90s and beyond, we began struggling with assessment of uh, change and with the human role in it and, and the issue. And really, these two activities, which I'll characterize as the longer time scale or greenhouse, if you want to use that term, um, versus the interannual time scale, those two core programmatic activities actually characterize the evolution of the climate service. They aren't everything, but they're 90% of what was going on. Toga was first because nature was the kindest to us in that time scale. Um, and then came the longer time scale and the evolution of this remarkable thing that's called the National Assessment. Here today you heard, and you will continue to hear from a couple people who played a remarkable role in the evolution of the National Assessment. 
our overall moderator, Kathy Jacobs, and the moderator of this panel, Jim Beiser. The national assessment now is an integral, ongoing, continuous part of our activity, of our climate service. And you will encounter efforts to curtail it. Well, we did a national assessment. Why would we want to do another one? And the answer is because you assess constantly. It's has its analog on the weather time scale. You predict the weather every day out for the next five to ten. And on the long time scale, we make an assessment every five years or, or thereabouts. And it must continue indefinitely. And it is a core part of what you do that will, in effect, produce research dollars uh, for future activity because becoming the integral to the affairs of the society is a great thing for science. And I, I charge you as an individual, I, I guess because that's all I can do now, uh, keep planning, keep approaching the system, broaden and deepen your research program, and Today and tomorrow, celebrate how much you've achieved together in setting up a, a national service on climate time scales. It once seemed impossible. Thank you. So I hope you get a sense of uh, what we were trying to do here by setting the stage, giving some history. You heard from uh, in the video, you heard from a leader in uh, the university, so an academic leader from the institutional uh, uh, side. We heard from a leader in the physical sciences, a leader in the social sciences, a leader in government. It takes that kind of leadership all coming together to be able to create something uh, as wonderful as uh, the IRI. And as I was thinking about it, there's an awful lot of guys um, in, in, up here, in fact, uh, uh, not a lot of diversity, but then I started thinking about perhaps you would uh, also see this as part of your le legacy. Uh, the next generation of the leaders in program or in climate, uh, a, institutional leaders are actually sitting in the room, uh, the next generation, and uh, check their gender out, Lisa Goddard, Claudia Nuremberg, Lisa Vaughn. We have the next generation coming through, so I guess I don't feel so bad uh, that we're all guys up here. Uh, so. The, I'm gonna, uh, we're going to get a chance, we have half an hour actually uh, for questions here and I, we really did want to uh, save enough time uh, for people to ask questions. I see we have people here from all, uh, different countries and all ages and et cetera. So I'd like to encourage everyone just to think about what might be the kind of question that you would like to ask of uh, the gentleman up here. Uh, and you'd like other people to hear, because of course you, I encourage you over the next two days to, to sit next to them during lunch or find them at breaks and have these conversations with them. It, and um, so we're going to be doing that. I don't know where we are with microphones. I'll try to make sure that people do uh, move those around. Uh, if not, maybe you can just shout out and I'll just repeat it for, um, for the recording. Everyone, this is all being uh, live streamed. I don't know if you told people. Uh, earlier, Lisa, but anyway, it's live stream, so video stream. Uh, the, uh, so, think about that, think about while you're thinking about questions, I'm, in fact, I'm even going to look to the, the, the panel, because I know that you all haven't seen each other for a while, and maybe you did have a burning question that you'd like others to hear of each other, so think about something you'd like to ask the other, and uh, and while you're doing that, I've got one for Mickey, so that chartreuse uh, flyer, now what do you call it? Circular that you saw when you picked that that chartreuse circular you said that that's where you started Getting into this field or sort of got you started if you hadn't picked that one up Or it was orange or a different color green. Or green. If you hadn't picked it up um, well, Where do you think you'd be in your career? What would you have dedicated your career instead of doing all this El Nino stuff? What would it have been and I'm thinking uh, not so much like telling us the whole story. I'm thinking what kind of advice would you give some of the younger people here when they're thinking about their career? What might be that chartreuse uh, pamphlet that they might find? Well, to answer it one way, I can say, if I didn't pick up that circular and continue what I was doing, I, I would have had a real job. Uh, okay. Now, coming back, uh, you know, I, I've, 
Uh, I wanted to ask these two guys how they got all those awards. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, I guess if I had uh, if I had to say it in five words, I would tell everybody younger than me, and I think that's just about everybody in here. <laughs> um, look back to look ahead. I think what's happened is something I call the century effect. You know, we're in the 2000s, we're in the third millennium. I think the tendency, it's, and it's reinforced by publications and other demands of publication, is don't say anything before 2000. I mean, it's not current. There's so much news and information out there, everybody wants the latest. But I have, I have to tell you, some of the stuff I've been reading is, is not as good as Herbert Flown's 1970, Fleer and Flown. And, 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 I mean, go back. It's okay to go back and look at the early stuff and, and make sure that the, public, the, the publishers let you cite it. If I hadn't done that, what I had been working on was droughts, uh, was, excuse me, revolutions. The turning points in my life, and there are many, actually, when you think about it, um, the, the turning point for me, when I had been studying revolution and decolonization in Africa since 61, 62, until uh, two, uh, 1992, uh, sorry, 1972, I saw a flyer to go uh, on drought in Africa. I was interested in Africa. I was doing decolonization in Africa. I was doing studies in Africa. And I said, I'm going to go to that meeting. This is 72. You had no money for travel, no money for support. You just so I went to Syracuse University, the Maxwell School, and they had this drought meeting, and that was the catalyst to say, okay, look, I'm looking at humans versus humans. They're killing each other, starving, whatever. I'm going to focus on humans versus nature and climate. So treat climate sort of as a predator in a way. It's most of the time climate is good to us, but sometimes it's like a predator. And, and, and I started with Ethiopia, the West African Sahel, did the Sahel all the way across to Ethiopia, and I found that the government in Ethiopia used the drought in Ethiopia from 72 to 74 to starve the region of people wanting to overthrow the government. And over a million people died. And livestock, a million died, whatever, huge numbers. And that was the official number was a million people died in Ethiopia. So then I found that people used the climate to kill other people. But I didn't dwell on that one. I went on to other things. And how to use climate information, and what were the obstacles to the use of that information. Because in theory, it's valuable. Forecasts are valuable. Every time someone makes a forecast, someone is listening. It has an impact. Even bad forecasts have impacts. But there's a way to make that use of this climate information a win-win situation, a win for everybody. And I guess that, that's the other thing. And the third thing, if I can quickly, it's this, and I've always thought this, ever since they created the IRI, ever since they talked about creating the IRI, it's this thing that bothers me. It's the end-to-end -end forecast system. I produce a forecast, I give it to you. And no, there are three ends. Tell me if it's any good. Tell me what you need. So I, you know, it sounds silly. So I call it end to end to end. The feedback loop. Every model has a feedback loop. The simplest models have a feedback loop. So yeah, you understand, you're in the business, you understand end to end. I want to hear what you have to say, but I'm not telling you to tell me. Make it end to end to end. All right, thanks. Um, I think they've heard you about the end to end to end. Um, uh, <laughs> Where are you looking? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, did you want to? Yeah, I mean, I wanted to end to end to end. Um, Don't make a joke of this. You're going to say end to end to end to end. No, 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 no. <laughs> I saw it coming. There, there's a joke about end to end by Dorothy Parker, which I won't repeat here. But yeah. It's much funnier than. But, I mean, I think Mickey was right in the sense of uh, we first started forecasting, we had this sort of, if you build it, they will come attitude, you know, that you just put the forecast out and then people will figure out how to use it well and so on and so forth. 
And I, I do think now the, uh, at least with the IRI and other, some other institutions, there's been a, a real change to the point where the idea is to find out what people, try to figure out what people need and see if you can tailor the forecasts so that they can, in fact, use them. So you're giving them what they need. And that does mean um, starting from, if you want, the, the other end and the forecast end. There's, of course, a difficulty there is that what people would, as is so often the case in life, what people would really like and really want and really need is not necessarily what we know how to deliver. Okay? But, you know, it tells you what direction at least to try to work in. And then you have to be a little bit creative. So there's a limit to how much skill we can have in forecasting. We know some of it is our ineptitude, but a lot of it is intrinsic in the nature of the system. And you have to figure out how to deal with that as well. Um, correct. Mike, anything? Or shall we... I, would, I would ask a question. Uh, I'll direct it to Mark. But in fact, it's a question for anyone in the, in the room that wants to reflect on it. One of the things I do uh, almost on a daily basis is look at the warm pool in the um, eastern Pacific. It's rather dramatic. And look at some of the associated convective activity. But it leaves me with a question that uh, probably has multiple parts. But in essence, have we yet seen the full global manifestation of the warm pool as it now exists? Is the timing about right? Is it, is, it, is it troubling that we haven't seen more of a global manifestation? Is Tony Barnes still here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it's not Yeah. Well, I would, I would sort of love to pass that one along to other people. I think actually things are, and, and uh, others can comment, but I think as far as I can see, because I don't pay as close attention as I used to, things are moving along the way they should, but, you know, it's only November. Uh, and the best and worst, depending on where you are, Ricky's very big on winners and losers. So it is, is yet to come when we go into the full winter season. So I'm going to come down, uh, Jim, and I'm going to put you on the spot. Do you want to take a shot at Mike's question? Yeah. <laughs> My, there are microphones in the back here, so you don't need to run up and down. Well, he just asked if there's a manifestation of uh, the warm pool if we're seeing I'll talk about it anyway. tomorrow. You are? Okay. Can you wait till tomorrow, Mike? Yes. Okay. Uh, Any questions? I do have questions. Well, okay. <laughs> so, um, your name first, please. Oh, uh, Jim Kinter from COLA. Um, it seems to me with a panel of such enormous distinction in front of us, we have to ask uh, some important questions. And I'm not going to try to pretend to do that. But um, if you think about computing, Amdahl's law says we find the component which holds us back the most, and we fix that one to make progress. So I'm wondering what you guys think is holding us back the most at this point. Is it our physical models? Is it the way we're interpreting the models? Is it our interaction with the social sciences? Is it the way we're communicating? Uh, you know, there's a lot of possibilities. I don't want to try to make the universe of possibilities for you, but, but what do you think is really keeping us from making progress? Okay. I think oh, there's oh, progress. I don't, I don't know. I, I, there's not no progress. The modelers can tell you their, their problems. I think social sciences are more engaged now than they ever were. Um, it's always funding problem, I guess. Uh, I think I kind of I don't want to single out any organization, but NSF isn't really really good at merging the sciences with the social, <laughs> but they should be. There should be more funds to look at the other ends, not just the science end. But I think things are good. I'm not displeased with the science. I mean, as an observer, I've been around it for forty some years, listening to others and and. Uh, I think they're doing good. Um, a quick answer, which is a little bit redundant from something I said before, but let, let me put it more graphically. I, I kind of think that for the last uh, at least five years, if not a, a year or two more, the community's largely been coasting on 
programmatic accomplishments from an earlier era, believing that programmatic accomplishments uh, in this era were impossible. And I believe it impedes our research systematically. And I believe that uh, I'm trying to urge you to uh, accept that reality and approach it with optimism and with hard work. Someone said once, and how true, I think it's incredibly true, that luck, uh, good luck, is the residual of hard work. And one day, the government and other governments will come to you, and they will have noticed you, and they will ask you some profoundly in-depth questions, and, and, and in, implied in what they ask you is a sense that they, they get it, and they're actually willing to put some more effort and resources into this activity, and you must be incredibly prepared when that moment comes. That's why Eisenhower's of planning is everything. <laughs> Those moments come. They're the residual, and whether they're lucky for you or not is a matter of the work you've put in before. So I really think the principal impediment is we need an expanded research program, and that means we need people who believe that can be achieved. Because I have the microphone and, and because I'm sitting here, I want to call out some other individuals. But first, let me say, since I'm calling out now some, in part, agency individuals, let me say something else. Demand more of the National Science Foundation than you typically get. Revolving, rotating to Washington and turning a proposal processing crank is sort of the, the relaxation mode, the, the default mode at NSF, and you want more programmatic leadership from the National Science Foundation than that. It's been true for decades. There have been moments of incisive, spectacular leadership, Bob Perel, for example. And there have been moments that have been pretty flat, pretty disappointing. Demand more of NSF. NOAA. My tenure at NOAA was actually easy compared to the present. And I'll tell you why. I had a staff of incredible people, um, 50 or so people, that just made life easy for me. I didn't have to ever touch a keypad. You prove anything from email to anything else. What a, what a life, what a wonderful life. If I could only return to a world where I never had to touch a keypad, I would do it in a microsecond. Um, I want to mention some names in NOAA and, and ask you, thank them, acknowledge them, be aware they, they have suffered for your sake. <laughs> <laughs> because now, it's not easy anymore. It's not as easy as it was when I was there. It's a lot harder. Claudia Nuremberg, who's here, Lisa Vaughn, who's here, Roger Polardi, who's here, really struggle on your behalf, and they struggle against almost impossible odds to keep the government straight, to keep it on track, to keep it functioning. I hope you will all thank them. I want to call out one other name that's probably obvious, but a few years ago, I would have put the probability of IRI continuing indefinitely at about 0.2. <laughs> An honest assessment, I didn't expect it to make it. And I believe that Lisa Goddard and... What is the lead time for impacts globally? Because when we say the uh, Pacific is warming and we expect an O'Neill, it takes quite some time. But then it seems the whole world expects it at the same time. But there is no science that gives us when it should be hitting India or the African continent. What's the lead time between the observed and the actual impacts? When does the bus arrive? Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. So the question is, uh, what's the lead time uh, from what you see in the ocean and when uh, different parts of the world are being impacted? Um, and actually, I'm going to let you answer if you want to, but I'm also going to, we have a number of experts here in the room that probably would be dying to answer it as well, so it's not just stuck that, but... Oh. Chad? You're hiding over there. What do you know, think? I'm, I'm, I'm hiding. It's, it's not a simple answer, except for the fact... Oh, except for the uh, fact that, that you know, what lead time you might have depends where you are. Uh, as, as the ENSO cycle evolves, uh, it involve, involves big shifts, particularly in, in the uh, global circulation system and 
the, uh, the rainfall patterns around, around the globe. Uh, there are different rainy seasons in different parts of the world. There are uh, a sequence of events that will, uh, will happen at, at different times. North, North America, it's, it's uh, winter. Uh, we were asking, somebody said, well, where, where's the ENSO? Uh, it, it just, it, it's underway. Uh, West coast of the United States, uh, it's a little early. It's going to be another month or two before things really uh, uh, start start to crank up. Other other parts of the world, there's a, there's a different seasonality. Uh, most of that has been documented, uh, and uh, I'm trying to think. I can't. My memory's shot, so I'm not going to I'm not going to try to uh, remember uh, which happened where. But there is, in fact, uh, this this issue of it depends. Uh, where you are and and uh, where the ENSO is in relation to your annual cycle. So when thinking about the climate service or climate uh, or even uh, what the IRI does, it's not an El Nino forecasting service that uses that as a basis and a foundation amongst others to talk to people about them. Uh, their climate and impending uh, events. So, um, at least in my work, I talk about droughts or floods. I don't talk about El Nino. I talk about the impacts because then we don't have to start getting into so how many months before uh, you start seeing things in different places. You really are focusing on answering those questions right in the place, and you're talking to them about things that they are experiencing. So, um, okay. To manage this, we only have about 20 minutes left. So if you have some, uh, a question or an uh, independent question of the panel. I just want to make one comment. Okay. Okay. So there were these Rumbelowski and Halford papers that you know, were 30 years plus ago? 87. Yeah, almost 30 years. Okay, so the work was done 30 years ago. Uh, and that's the kind of what we have as an answer, and they've been turned into cartoons that everybody uses in talks is these are the you know, and so impacts. Uh, somebody wants to do a nice paper and a nice service, you could, there's 30 years more data, you could redo what they did and it would be very valuable and it would be, you could try to make a little bit more out of uh, what the uncertainties are than was possible then. Um, so anyway, we have 10 minutes left. Um, I saw a question over here. No, I don't know. I don't mean to point, but I don't know how else to bring your mic. Thank you. Uh, it appears, this is in response to the question on Africa. It appears that for the Indian monsoon, the critical facet of El Nino is the convection over the equator and central Pacific. And once that has kicked off, uh, it seems to respond simultaneously. So the Evolution to the stage where the convection over the equatorial central Pacific has to be monitored. But once that starts, it appears that the monsoon rainfall uh, feels the impact simultaneously. Okay, thank you. I see, Kanta, did you have your hand up? And I'll look over here. Yeah. Uh, good morning. My name is Kanta Kumari, and I'm from the World Bank. And uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to be here and to listen to such a distinguished panel looking back uh, at the achievements. I have a question which is, I think, around the whole question of development and trying to make sure that we do actually have the better climate-informed development. And I wanted to draw from the wisdom of the panel. I mean, you've looked back and given us some turning points that have really helped us to get where we are today. And I think that the climate information and the climate services are, are very much advanced. And yet, I think when we work with our client countries, we still don't get it to the end user in the last mile. If we were sitting 10 years or 20 years from now, what would be some turning point that you would have liked to look back that came out of this conference that really made a difference to the way we conceive development uh, uh, you know, today. I uh, just wanted to put that for your thoughts. Cool. I'll take a, a shot at part of it. Um, what could happen in the next 20 years that would be remarkable? 
a, <clears throat> a time scale we haven't discussed much, the interdecadal variability. And the modes of interdecadal variability are largely known, but if I had to highlight an area that had practical importance for people, for the evolution of social institutions, as well as for the, uh, the progress in the science, I would highlight the interdecadal time scale, the modes of variability, more research into those, so that we really can answer questions which are probably will be pressing in the coming 20 years, one of which is the North Atlantic thermohaline circulation. What is the state of it? How does it reflect the interdecadal variability that I've suggested? And, and what can you say in a predictive mode about that process? And that's just one example of, of the kind of things we might focus on, any one of which could be a turning point in understanding the, the system and adapting to it. Anyone else up here? Okay. I, I have a lot to say, so let's sit near each other's lunch. Because some of what I have to say is about the bank. Um, Okay, aside from that, I think El Nino and uh, disaster risk reduction uh, can serve as a link between the here and now and climate change adaptation. Okay? Because even these communities aren't working closely together. I, I'm not even talking about the bank, I'm talking about in general, in government agencies. So there's a disaster, come in, clean it up. <coughs> not much money goes into disaster risk reduction. But with climate change on the horizon, <coughs> or here, we have to start, uh, I think El Nino is the way, okay? Not just El Nino, it's El Nino, it's Enzo. But Enzo didn't catch on. But we really, when we say El Nino, we mean the whole uh, quasi-periodic cycle. So I think that's a place to focus now. And uh, whether working groups, but how to get the climate change people working with the disasters reduction, uh, is very important. Um, the DRR funds are really paltry compared to, you know, it's clean up, it's okay. You get money to clean up and you don't get money to get ready for it. That's kind of strange. So I think there is a link and that can help development processes. And I call it resilient adaptation, not resilience, or not adaptation, because it's never ending, okay? The best practice today is not gonna be best practice tomorrow. And a lot of things, and we don't have time, uh, we don't have 20 years because uh, I, I've been someplace that uh, just like uh, green is the new black for fashion, I believe 2020 is the new 2050. And I believe 2050 is the new 2100. So things are seem to be accelerating and we're getting things before we expect them, like the Arctic sea ice something 13 years earlier than the models were suggesting. So I think we have to bring it, I, th I think, El Nino can serve as a stepping stone in the development process. It's not just a one-off every two to seven years. The problem with El Nino, it's not nature's problem, it's our problem, is it's out of phase with attention spans of society. It, it said uh, 20, 30 years ago, the attention span in the American public was like 2.3 years, somehow calculated by Anthony Downs, okay? 2.3 years. El Nino's come seven years, or here, whatever. We're out of phase, we forget about it. That's why we have to link the El Nino and La Nina. So maybe for bad times for El Nino, good times for La Nina. Link it in, it's the use of chronic information, whether it's gonna save you or it's gonna make you prosper. Yeah, um, I would, in a sense, reiterate what Mickey said and put it this way, that if you want people to make use of this information, at the, what's essential is to develop some sort of trust in, um, that it's valuable, that it can, uh, they should pay attention, that should affect their behavior. You can't do that by worrying about what's going to happen 100 years from now. You have to be able to say something about what's going to happen next year and then say within the next decade. Most of what we can say about, that's use, about that that's useful is, is uh, related to El Nino. Okay. Not all together, but most of it is. And I think the other thing that helps now is there used to be this almost prohibition about talking about adaptation because it was somehow going to interfere with efforts of mitigation. And I think everybody recognizes we're past that now. But adaptation is about, in this instance, adapting to climate, not just 
anthropogenic climate change, but all of the fluctuations that climate throws at us. Excellent, thanks. And I think we're running out of time. Kevin had it, and, and Mike, maybe if that can be really quick, um, because I promised Kathy I'd end at 25 after. Going back to the original comments, so the two things that occurred to me. The first was that prior to Togar, there were meteorologists and there were oceanographers. And the oceanographers went out and did uh, uh, and, and gathered their own data, and it was proprietary and it wasn't shared. And Togar really developed climate scientists, I think, and Mark and Will wish to comment on that. But the other thing which I think hasn't happened, which relates to Mike's comments about uh, the, the climate assessment, is that, and I, I agree with some of the inferences here, that the interannual problem is very much something that should feed into, uh, and, and a lot of lessons can be learned for the climate change problem, and yet we still have interannual scientists and the Climate Prediction Center is a good example and climate change scientists and their separate communities to a very large degree. And I wonder if you can comment on that. Yeah. Um, that's right, and, and it is unfortunate. And Kevin, it is good to remind us that one of the legacies of Togo was to bring together two communities that now seem uh, close, but weren't when we started. <coughs> And one of the ways that worked was to have um, a set of very clear questions that you could articulate in English and actually translate it to other languages without loss of meaning. Okay. And we need some more of that in terms of linking the physical scientists and the social scientists now. And the, the second link is climate is a continuum and what will happen in the next decade will be partly a consequence of uh, anthropogenic impact on the climate system, but even more natural variability. And if we look at those questions, we will bring these two together because it's necessary to do so. I'll tell you another anecdote, and I'll, I'll put it in provocative terms just to make, make all of us think, myself included. Um, my activity in the government, I had the formal advisors I used. And this room is, is quite a number of people in this room who served in that, that capacity. I used to go before my advisory panel and say, I thought reductionism is dead. And the panel would say, oh, Mike, Mike, Mike. And I'd say, all right, all right, it's of limited value then, I'm back way off. But let me leave you with a thought. Reductionism has reached its limit. We've done everything we can, and it has been remarkable looking back at the couple of millennia. But largely now, the exciting things to be learned are beyond interdisciplinary. They are completely integrated problems and should be stated in such and researched as such. Mike, I'm afraid we've run out of time. Is it, can you can that one hold for? Sure. Not the microphone. Well, except that I. all of you that was a uh, that was a remarkable uh, amount of expertise up here I, I did learn one important thing uh, basically but for the miracles of modern chemistry I too would be up here if only I just had gray hair <laughs> but anyway um, so uh, I thought we learned a lot from the, the mics and the marks uh, and I wanted to summarize uh, some of that Partly because the point of being here is not just to look back, but to look forward. And as I said at the beginning of this uh, session, 
uh, we're here to frame the next steps. And I hope all of you see your job as being that person who's going to be sitting up here in 20 years talking about what you accomplished. There's not one person in this room who can't do the same kinds of things um, that these folks just described. So I'm, not, I'm talking to everyone in this room. Um, and what the main message here was the importance of vision and leadership. And um, we are talking about people who have been really brave in the face of really difficult situations. And also people who are willing to bend the rules, um, which is actually my favorite thing in the whole world. Um, and I think many people who know me know that. But honestly, if you let the rules define what it is that you're going to achieve, then most likely you won't be sitting up here. So that's just an important um, lesson. Uh, I think we, we all are sort of in awe of what has been accomplished from a scientific perspective in terms of understanding what's going on in the last 20 years. Uh, I, at least, am not yet in awe of what we've actually been able to do with that information in terms of building what is truly a climate service that actually supports decision making in a reasonable uh, time frame. But we are clearly on this path, um, the evolution from basic science to societal relevance. Um, we have been talking about that for a long time, and some of you in the audience are uh, probably rolling your eyes big time, um, because honestly, this has been the big challenge, is getting it into the societal relevance part of it. But we, we do know now um, things like the memory in the system, um, the connection, the teleconnections issues. Um, we really do have uh, a lot of knowledge of how the oceans and the atmospheres inter interact. Um, but again, this, this being ready for opportunities and, uh, and actually recognizing opportunities where they lie is an important point. Uh, I think my call talked about the importance of planning, and, and I really call it um, being ready for the next great disaster, um, and using that as a springboard to something uh, that you really need to accomplish anyway, and we may actually have that opportunity before us at this moment. Um, I was really interested in hearing the climate as a predator theme. Um, and clearly, we need to um, think about climate in, uh, in partnership as well as climate as a, part, as a predator. But that was, um, I, I'm afraid, that's really what it looks like, particularly for the developing world. Um, and there's this ongoing refrain of talking about the other end. Uh, clearly, science, uh, sort of the one end of the first end, uh, there's definitely a first end and a second end of the end to end. Uh, and the need for really more investment in, in uh, the societal end of all of that. Um, I guess finally and possibly most importantly, the idea of knitting together what we know about short-term variability, you know, seasonal to interannual, with what we know about climate change is one of the great challenges and I hope that there will be quite a bit more discussion about that as, as we go forward. Uh, my favorite, uh, my favorite phrase from the from the morning was the adhocracy in the belly of a bureaucracy. Uh, I like that very much. Uh, so those are my uh, those are my observations from this morning. Um, but before um, I allow you to go have caffeine, and it is important to know that Jim is afraid of me because I am between him and caffeine. I know that's a big issue for him. Um, we, we would like you to know a little bit more about who is in the audience. Um, and because we can't actually in let everyone introduce themselves right now, what we'd like is for you to stand up if you are a member of a group. And I'm going to name the groups, and you can stand up as many times as you like. The purpose of this is so those of you who don't actually know each other at least understand what category of person these other people are and can go talk to them during coffee and lunch. We really hope, again, that you're going to be talking to somebody you actually have not met before, at least three of those people before you leave tomorrow. <laughs>